Live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. Usually, when a team loses ground in the AP poll and loses a chance to climb up the rankings, it's for one of a few reasons. The most obvious reason is that the team lost. You're not going to go up after a loss. That's just not how it works. Maybe you won, but you looked incredibly unconvincing, especially if it was against a weaker opponent. Maybe you didn't do anything wrong, but the team in front of you beat a great opponent or looked dominant to the point where they were able to widen their gap, or the team behind you did the same thing and leapfrog you in the rankings. Maybe you had a key player suffer an injury, and the voters simply don't know how good you're going to be without that player in the lineup. All of these are reasons why your ranking might drop on a week-to-week -week basis. So what if I said that in 1992, Texas A&M's pursuit to move up the rankings got negatively impacted, and none of these things happened? No action of note happened above or behind them. The Aggies did what they had to do and played incredibly well against their competition. And yet, despite all of that, the Aggies still did not get any love whatsoever when it came to the AP votes, to the point where there was a public outcry over it. For the AP poll on the week of November 24th, 1992, that's exactly what happened. And it could not have come at a worst possible time, considering how late in the season we were getting. This is the story behind Texas A&M, and arguably the most controversial vote involving them in the history of the AP poll. Before I talk about the actual controversy in question, we need some context to understand just how Texas A&M was doing, as well as what happened during this game that led people to believe that their ranking would not be as bad as it wound up being. Entering the 1992 season, expectations were extremely high for the Aggies to do well in the Southwest Conference, and understandably so. They were coming off of a great 10-2 season where they won the Southwest Conference, made it to the Cotton Bowl, and finished 12th in the AP poll with the 10 wins being tied for their best total since World War II. On top of that, they finished the season undefeated in conference play, making it the first time since 1956 under Bear Bryant that they finished the season with a perfect conference record. Head coach R.C. Slocum had seen the program improve in wins in each of his three seasons, so entering his fourth season, people were expecting Texas A&M to be a really good team. However, I'm not sure anyone expected them to be quite this good. Because in 1992, Texas A&M was one of the best teams in not just the Southwest Conference, but in the entire NCAA. Through their first 10 games of the season, they were 10-0, and had a ranked win in there against Stanford on the opening night of the season, in a game that was held in California. They did this thanks to an offense that was starting to peak at just the right time. In the three games leading up to the one we're about to talk about, their offense was a machine, scoring 41 points against SMU, 40 points against Louisville, and 38 points against Houston. When you're averaging just a hair under 40 points per game in your last three, and none of the numbers are skewing the data at all to make it misleading, that is a really good sign. And they had a great defense as well, and a defense that, through the first 10 games, had only allowed 14.5 points per game. Part of why Texas A&M was so good in 1991 was because of their suffocating defense that was fifth in all of college football, allowing just 12.8 points per game. And in 1992, they were picking up right where they left off, as they had four games where their opponent failed to score double digits, including that ranked win against Stanford. And the good news for Texas A&M was that for their great performance, and for being undefeated through their first 10 games, they were receiving recognition in the AP poll. After starting the season off ranked number 7, they jumped up to number 5 by the middle of September, and by this point, they were ranked number 4. I think just about every Texas A&M fan at College Station, and in the country for that matter, would have gladly taken a number 4 ranking heading into the Saturday before Thanksgiving. The bad news, however, was that the ranking wasn't high enough to position themselves for a top 2 spot, and a shot at the national championship under the new system by the Bull Coalition. And time was running out for them to make a move, especially after the latest ranking, which not only had them stagnant, but at Florida State, despite the Seminoles having a loss, which came against number 2 Miami in the famous Wide Right 2 game, leapfrogged them. The top two spots were held by an undefeated Miami team and an undefeated Alabama team. And theoretically, one of them could slip up, as Miami still had to play a top 10 Syracuse team on the road, and Alabama still had to play a top 15 Florida team. If Texas A&M moved up to number 3, which they thought they would after the previous number 3 team, Michigan, 
tied at home against an unranked Illinois team, then if the Aggies took care of business and one of those two teams fell, the Aggies would be competing for their first championship since they won the Sugar Bowl and finished the season ranked number one all the way back in 1939, when Homer H. Norton was commanding the team. Instead, their road got a bit harder, and it was going to be somewhat harder after Coach Slocum said that he wouldn't run up the score just for the polls, because that wouldn't be the right thing to do. As Slocum said on that, I don't care what people think. Up next for the Aggies was a Southwest Conference game against TCU. If the Aggies won this game, then they'd be the Southwest Conference champions. And considering the fact that they entered this game as three touchdown favorites, and considering the fact that TCU was not a good team whatsoever, as they entered this game with a 2-8-1 record, and got annihilated by Miami by 35 points when the two teams met earlier in October, this was not just a must-win game for the Aggies, but a must-dominate game. They had to blow the doors off of the Horned Frogs if they wanted to jump up. And consider this. The gap between Florida State, who was off this week, and Texas A&M was a mere three points. Dominate this game, and you might leapfrog the Seminoles. Worst case scenario, that gap isn't going to get any bigger. With that, we head to Kyle Field. It's Saturday, November 21st, 1992, and it's time for this critical matchup right before Thanksgiving. And it is an absolutely beautiful day for some football. And by beautiful, I mean absolutely horrendous. The field conditions were not pleasant to say the least, as the game was played in let's just say less than ideal conditions that left many fans soaked and resulted in many fans wearing their ponchos. And remember how I said that to keep their championship hopes alive, they had to dominate? Well, the Aggies did that and then some. Because on this day, the Horn Frogs stood no chance. We didn't know which Horn Frogs team we'd get against a ranked opponent. The team that somehow beat a top 20 ranked Texas, or the team that got annihilated by Miami. Turns out, we got the former, because at no point did TCU look even the slightest bit competitive in this one. Texas A&M won this one 37-10, and all of the stats went in their favor, and I truly mean all of them. Whereas TCU only picked up 13 first downs over the course of the entire game, Texas A&M picked up 25, nearly doubling their total. Whereas TCU only held onto the ball for 25 minutes, Texas A&M held onto the ball for 35 minutes. Anytime there is a 10 minute difference in time of possession, that bodes very well for the team that holds onto the ball more. Whereas TCU lost two fumbles in the bad weather, Texas A&M was way more cautious and careful, and didn't lose a single fumble. And the big disparity by far came in rushing yards, as it's safe to say that Texas A&M dominated this game on the ground. Because whereas TCU only had 65 rushing yards on 37 carries, averaging a mere 1.7 yards per carry, Texas A&M had an astonishingly high 341 rushing yards on 5.9 yards per carry. No wonder they were able to dominate the time of possession the way that they did. Texas A&M outgained TCU 447 to 192 in total yardage, meaning that the Aggies had nearly two and a half times the yardage that TCU did. It was yet another dominant performance for the Aggies on offense and on defense, and it was a great way to end their home slate, as this was their final home game of the season. Not only did the Aggies cover the spread, but the Aggies won the Southwest Conference for the second straight season because of this victory, clinching it with one game to go and confirming their spot in the Cotton Bowl. And Coach Slocum was thrilled with this performance, saying on his team's effort not just in this game but throughout the whole season, it just points out how difficult it is to win 11 games. Because with the defending champs, we get everybody's best shots. People look forward to playing us two weeks in advance. There is a saying that you can only control what you can control, and on this wet day down at College Station, the Aggies did everything that they had to do. They won their game convincingly, winning by four possessions and clinching the conference title. And remember, the team in front of them, Florida State, did not play, and there was no chance that any team could leapfrog Texas A&M. The number five team was Washington, and they lost the Apple Cup to Washington State 42-23. The number six team was Michigan, and they tied Ohio State 13-13. The number 17 was Notre Dame, and they didn't play. And the number 18 was Syracuse, and they lost to Miami. In other words, when the team in front of you doesn't play, the teams behind you all do nothing, and you take care of business, in the absolute worst case scenario, nothing whatsoever should change. Maybe you don't leapfrog Florida State, but you don't get punished in the process. Well, that's where the AP voters threw a curveball. Because when the rankings came out, 
everyone was stunned at what happened with Texas A&M. Because as it turns out, they went down. On November 22nd, one day after Texas A&M dominated against TCU, they eagerly awaited their poll results. The bad news for the Aggies was that they did not move up to number three and did not achieve their highest ranking of the season. Florida State was still one spot ahead of them, which makes sense. Even if you have qualms about Florida State leapfrogging Texas A&M in the first place, you can't have any qualms about Texas A&M not leapfrogging Florida State, since it would be unfair to punish the Seminoles for not playing. That's not the issue. The issue lies in what happened to the gap between Florida State and Texas A&M. Because somehow, the gap between the two schools actually increased after Saturday's action. That's right. Remember how the gap between Florida State and Texas A&M was just 3 points? Well now, it was 18 points. Someone explain to me how that makes any sense whatsoever. Florida State did nothing, and Texas A&M dominated in a 27 point victory that was never a contest and did it against a conference foe, so it's not even like you're sending a message for scheduling a cupcake. And everyone else below Texas A&M either didn't play, or lost, or tied, so it's not like there were any teams stealing votes. Yet somehow, people watched what Texas A&M did, saw that they won by 27 points, and punished them by increasing their gap for no apparent reason. I listed off a ton of reasons at the top of this video as to why a team might drop in the rankings, or why a gap between two teams in the rankings might grow larger. None of those reasons whatsoever apply to Texas A&M. They did everything that they had to do, and somehow got punished for it. Coach Slocum had no justification or reason for it. He was just as confused as everyone else. As he said following the shocking poll results, it's disappointing to be one of three undefeated, untied teams in the country and be ranked fourth. I think a lot of credit has to be given when you win every game and not have a slip-up. But at that point, Slocum knew that his hopes of competing for a championship were over. If they were losing ground even after dominating on the field, and even after just about every result around them went their way, then it was not going to happen. A win against Texas on Thanksgiving to close out the regular season would be unlikely to make any dent in the rankings, as Texas was 6-4 and four and was in somewhat of a tailspin after losing two of their last three games to unranked teams in TCU and Baylor. They now needed two of the three teams in front of them to lose, and it was unlikely that Miami would be one of them, as they were playing San Diego State, a team that was 5-4-1, and in their only game against a top-20 opponent all season, lost by 28 points. And both Florida State and Alabama had Florida left on their schedule, so unless Florida went 2-0, it was over. The AP voters made their feelings known about how they felt about Texas A&M after they won by 27 points, and inexplicably lost ground on a top three spot. Texas A&M would end the regular season ranked number four, and would not compete for a national championship, as they would go on to play Notre Dame in the Cotton Bowl and proceed to lose 28-3, finishing the season with a number seven ranking. Obviously, this season was incredible for the Aggies, even despite the hard loss at the end. The 12 wins set a program record for most wins in a season in school history, and it is a record that still holds up today 30 years later as since the program started playing football in 1894, more than 125 years ago, this 1992 team was the only one to finish the season with 12 wins. Their final ranking of number 7 was their highest since 1985, and was just the fourth time in the post-World War II era that the Aggies finished the season rank inside the top 10. But it has to be disappointing, knowing that you did everything in your power to do more, and it was taken from you completely out of your control. Because one of the harsh realities of college football, as shown by this and by countless other inexplicable examples over the years, is that you could do everything you were supposed to do, and you could blow down an opponent by four possessions and dominate them from start to finish. And you can impress on the field, but if you don't impress off the field with the voters, you're dead in the water. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com. And be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.